Labour's Shadow Foreign Secretary, Lisa Nandy, joins me now from Salford. Lisa Nandy, good morning. Um, same question I asked the Home Secretary. What will your memories of David Amos be? Well, I first met David when I was a newly elected MP just over a decade ago. In fact, I think he was one of the first people that I met in Parliament. And it was a fairly awkward moment because I've been asked if I would stand to be an officer of uh, an all-party parliamentary group that was looking at children in care. And I'd gone along to this meeting to put my name forward, only to discover that David was currently the office holder of that post and hadn't resigned or stood down or indicated that he wanted to do so. So we had this little awkward moment where he said, well, that's my job. And I said, oh, I thought it was my job and he, um, he anyway he responded with typical good grace and good nature I think in the end we shared the position and worked together on upholding the rights of children in care and that was very very David I think the word that's come up over and over again from colleagues on all parts of the political spectrum are he was just such a nice man and he was he was courteous he was nice he had a great sense of humor he wanted to get the job done and he was willing to work with whoever it took in order to do that with great manners great sense of fun, great energy as well, and he will be really, really missed by all of us. Do you think, I've just been talking to Home Secretary about this, do you think that there is a danger now that the link between the Member of Parliament and the constituency will be placed in danger by these events? Because we now have to think much more, I guess, about uh, the safety of people like yourself. I think my bigger fear is that this just keeps happening and we keep having this debate and then nothing very much changes. The, the Speaker of the House of Commons, Lindsay Hoyle, and John Burko before him have made big efforts to try to step up support and security for MPs. But the truth is that this isn't felt equally. There are some MPs who are far more at risk, who face far more abuse. There was an online report by Amnesty International a few years ago, for example, that found that Diane Abbott received half of all the online abuse levels at Members of Parliament. So there are, there are additional measures that are needed, not just about security, but just about support for people to be able to go about their daily lives, about proper advice. There's a huge disparity between the advice and support that's offered by different police services around the country. I mean, I had an experience of being um, accosted outside Parliament a few years ago during a rally um, uh, that it was about um, uh, it was a leave rally around Brexit. There was uh, effigies of Sadiq Khan and Theresa May being dragged through the street. We were told by police officers we had to walk through that rally in order to get into Parliament. We were surrounded and uh, there was very little response and when I complained to the parliamentary authorities about it and said there were people standing there watching this unfold, I was told well, unfortunately, people have strong views about Brexit and they're entitled to, to, um, to, 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 to voice them. Of course, I accept they are, but I don't accept that members of parliament should be blocked from entering parliament or intimidated in the course of their daily duties. I've spoken to other members of parliament who've had an amazing response from local police forces. So it's still very patchy. And I think we've yeah. got to get away from this idea that it's about whether you protect MPs or whether you protect democracy. You have to protect MPs to be able to go about their daily business and be free to speak on behalf of their constituents if you want to protect dem democracy. We've got to get the balance right. Practically, um, realistically, uh, I don't think I managed to get anything very specific from the Home Secretary, um, but what would you do? What, um, what would you want to happen now that would make you feel that you could carry out your democratic uh, duties uh, in full confidence that you would be safe? I'm not sure that we can ever get to that point, if I'm honest. We've had uh, Stephen Timms, one of my colleagues, was stabbed a few years ago. We had the case of the Lib Dem MP before that, whose caseworker was killed. We've had uh, a plot to murder Rosie Cooper, my neighbouring MP, and, of course, what happened to Joe and now David. I'm not sure that that moment is recoverable. 
Um, I, I say that with sadness, but I think there's an element of realism about this. MPs are well known in our constituencies. People tend to know where we live. We're out and about. We're normal human beings. We go out and about on the weekends and you know, go to the local shops. I, I'm not sure that we can ever eliminate the risk, but I think there are other things that can be done to reduce the risk. I think the suggestion from the Speaker about ensuring that anyone who wants or needs security at surgeries is a good idea, not least because people often know, even if we don't advertise them, that they're happening and so they can become a magnet for people who want to cause trouble. Um, I, I think there's more that we can do about the political culture. You alluded to it in the interview with Priti Patel, but I think we really do, all of us in Parliament, need to tone down the rhetoric towards one another, especially when that strays into rhetoric that is dehumanising, um, that treats people not as other fellow human beings or somehow questions people's motives. Most people go into Parliament, as you've seen with the outpouring of love for David, most people go into Parliament because they want to make things better. We might disagree on how to do that, but we've got to create a better well, culture if we want to actually achieve it. Where we see quite a lot of what you've just been talking about is on social media. And the Home Secretary seemed to hold open the possibility that the uh, right to anonymity, which currently exists on social media, uh, may not be sacrosanct. Would, would you support the idea that anonymity uh, be, is removed from people who post on social media platforms? I think the difficulty with removing anonymity altogether is that you've got pro-democracy protesters and campaigners, you've got um, whistleblowers, people around the world who sometimes have to use some level of anonymity in order to make themselves heard. And so the debate that we've been having in Parliament through the online safety bill is about how you get that balance right. There are limits, perhaps, that you can put on anonymous accounts for what they're able to do and how they're able to interact with other people online and there have to be, surely there has to be repercussions for people engaging in what would be criminal behaviour if it happened in person but doing so online whether they're anonymous or otherwise. I have to say I listened to Priti Patel talking about online safety and you know I know that she gets a lot of abuse on social media as well and I'm extremely sympathetic but it is a bit rich for the Home Secretary to say that she takes that very seriously when the government have been dragging their feet on this legislation for years and currently we're at a situation where they're not proposing that there'll be any penalties for top executives of tech companies who don't abide by the online proposed code. If there are repeated breaches so of that code if they're not upholding their responsibilities, there ought to be penalties for that. We can't continue with a situation in which Diane Abbott once described as the Wild West, okay. where some people are targeted so severely that it does impact on their ability to speak out, not just MPs, but you know, young people particularly voice those concerns as well, many of them driven offline so, by the amount of hate that is on there. So on social media, you would be open to some limits on anonymity and also uh, new penalties for the social media platforms. Yes, and we've, we've got to, you know, as I say, we've got to get the balance right because social media can be an enormous force for good. I see it very much in the course of my day job where you've got some incredible um, campaigners, the women of Belarus, the pro-democracy protesters mm. in Hong Kong, the young people of Afghanistan. They've managed to use social media in order to make themselves heard. And if you speak to Childline, they'll say that social media has been a, a major problem for a lot of young people, but it's also been a way in which young people can now reach out and get help in a way that they couldn't yeah. when I was a child. So we've got to get the balance right to make sure that we use this as a force for good in every era where we've been through technological revolutions. Revolutions, that's always been the case. The one thing I do agree with Priti Patel about is that I really don't think that we've got to grips with this yet. We haven't worked out how to manage it so that it works in the interest of democracy rather than working against it. Lisa Nandy, thank you very much indeed.